My name is Ron Cicada. Matthew Gerard with WeFund LA. And you are watching Jessica Fury's podcast. New episodes every Monday. Please make sure to like and subscribe. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host, Jessica Fury. Today we have Ron Cicada and Matt Gerard. They are loan officers with New American Funding. Before we get into this episode, I want you to like and subscribe because it helps continue to bring amazing people like Matt and Ron on the podcast. Guys, thank you for being here. Amazing. Welcome. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah. And great pronunciation on the name. Yes. Wait, thank so you. I stopped you and you were saying something about explaining your last name to people, cicada, because it's a bug yeah. <laughs> in Texas? <laughs> well, it's it's the easiest way to uh, you know kind of get a reference for how to pronounce it because it's spelled nothing like it sounds. It's spelled S-E-Q-U-E-I-R-A. A lot of vowels there together, but yeah, um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm Central American in origin. So when you pronounce the name in Spanish, it's Sequeira, right? Mm. That R kind of rolls off like a D. So I often, I've gotten all kinds of variations of the name. So there's a Cicada bug that's uh, you know pretty prevalent in Texas and back East. And it's kind of like a little bit of a cricket. So totally different spelling, but the way it sounds is... Uh, people have not been able to say my last name since the day I've been born. Really? Yeah. Fury? Mm -hmm. I feel like it's so... It's so How easy. do people pronounce it? Uh, Fury, furry, just like, <laughs> I, and it drives me crazy. It like drives me crazy. But when, then I'll say, when I first moved to LA, I'll say, someone said, oh, are you related to Mike Fury? Apparently he's like an actor or a fighter or something. And I was like, no. And then Brad Pitt did the movie Fury. Right, right. But it's F-U-R-Y, mine is an E. And then I would say to people sort of what you were doing with the bug thing, and I would say kind of like that movie that Brad Pitt was in, and they were like, I have no idea. So it was like, <laughs> <laughs> it was a total, like, didn't do anything for me. But I love that you guys wanted to come onto the podcast. I want to start with something right away, and that would be a market update. So can you give us a market update where we are now? And I want to hear something positive within what you guys are going to share. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I um, so it's interesting, you know. I mean, we uh, we've gotten a lot of gut punches here, you know, throughout the past year and a half as far as interest rates. I think we've all been very um, very spoiled for a while with low interest rates, and you start to see interest rates climb. It's it's really a battle against inflation, right? So. Um, you know, it's, uh, now we've seen rates with an eight in front of them and that gets a lot of people to, you know, panic, like, oh my goodness, should I even be thinking of purchasing a home? Right. Or financing in general, but you know, it's, it's all cyclical, right? So rates constantly move, they go up and down and I'll tell you, I mean, we got some promising news today. Um, the Fed met today and they're, they've paused the rate hikes, at least for the time being. It's all a little bit of a wait and see, right? It's all very data driven. They want to see consumer spending, right? Employment numbers and where that inflation number is going. But there's always a little bit of a lag effect from what the Fed does until that effect actually hits the market. So right now we've been kind of waiting and I... I think we've probably hit that crest now. So we saw a little bit of improvement here over the last couple of days in interest rates, which is great. Um, and we do have a, a, a long way to go to get, I don't know if we'll ever see rates in the two to 3% range where we were at their lowest, but that's, those were very anomalous times, you know? Um, I don't know that that's very normal, but um, yeah, I mean, hopefully, you know, you're starting to see some of the economic forecasters think that, hey, these rate hikes are have paused and maybe we'll start to see rates come down here within the next year. I think a lot of people got very eager to see rates come back down. So a lot of those forecasts were like, oh, well, you know, maybe it's only going to last a few months. And in fact, in order to to really fight inflation and not to have the market run away, you know, you've got to have to have a little bit of a wait and see, right? And the big problem that we're having is the lack of inventory. So there's still a high dem demand for housing. So even though they've hiked those interest rates up, there's still a need for housing. You still need to purchase, right? Um, I think overall, 
though the best thing to do is continue to have conversations about it, inspire confidence, right? Um, conversations about what? Conversations about owning real estate, the benefits of owning real estate, right? I think, um, you know, everybody's kind of been waiting to see if, oh, hey, are we going to see another crash, right? And there's a big reference back to 2008. That's a very different lending environment now, right? A lot of lessons were learned from those times. Um, you know, back then you had a lot of uh, a lot of uh, aggressive loans, right? Where you know, if you had a strong credit score, you could sign your name. If you had a beating heart, right, uh, you could state what your income was, and they'd be like, "Great, okay, that's what it is. Let's finance you." That doesn't happen anymore. Um, you do still have some programs that are very similar, but you have to show some serious money in the bank, right? You got to show a lot of reserves. You have to have a lot of capital. So, um, the lending environment has gotten a lot more responsible in that sense. Right. Um, but again, going back to the, to the initial point is, you know, I don't necessarily, and anything can happen, right. But I don't think that you're seeing, um, really the environment what that would warrant like a crash in the real estate market. Um, there's still a lot of people that need homes and there's a lack of inventory. So that's keeping the real estate market strong. And if anything, I think this is that opportunity, whatever slowdown we're getting from the effects of these higher interest rates, I think that's that window of opportunity for people to get in the market and purchase. Um, one of the things I always point out is it's it's only getting harder to purchase a home, right? I mean, especially in Southern California, right? The LA area, a very desirable market. Uh, there's a lot of competition, right? So when you had lower interest rates, you'd see a lot of bidding wars, right? So people were willing to pay more money for a home, right? And bid that price up. So the challenge that we would sometimes run into in that environment is, hey, okay, this person's willing to pay, let's just call it, you know, a million dollars for a property, but maybe the home only appraises at 900,000, right? So in these bidding wars, when we finance the property, we're financing it based off of the lesser of either the sales price or the appraised value, right? So even though somebody's willing to pay a million dollars, if we see that the appraised value comes in at 900, that's what we're basing our numbers off of in the loan, right? So if somebody needs to put 10% down, we're basing that 10% down off of that $900,000 number. But what happens is if they're still paying a million dollars for it, then they're having to cover that gap in cash. And for a lot of buyers, you know, the challenge is having the money to get into the market, to come up with a down payment. So now that you're not seeing as aggressive of bidding wars, I think that's a good opportunity for a buyer to, for a buyer to get in, right? It's less challenging than having to come up like in that example where I'm saying, hey, if they're paying more to have to bridge a gap of $100,000 plus whatever down payment you would have had to put on that property, you know, that that's uh it's a big strain for first-time home buyers, you know. How long have you been in the business? This is my 24th year. Okay. So 24th year. And Matt, you've been in it for- I've many? been in the industry for about three years now. Okay. So for three years. Now coming mm -hmm. from a standpoint of someone who is younger and a younger generation, how do you communicate with clients, potential buyers, or even friends? How are you communicating real estate, buying a home? Because the Gen Z as a whole, they want to buy. Mm -hmm. They want to buy. And there's, and correct me if I'm wrong, there's still about 24 to 25% of the buying market. So how do you communicate with l the customers that you're working with, the clients that you're working with, or friends in general? Um, I would say like the primary way that I communicate with, you know, people of my age group specifically is typically taking an approach from, you know, an, an investment standpoint. A lot of my friends have, you know, gone from, you know, trading stocks, they've moved on into bonds, and now they're looking for, you know, a greater and quicker return. And, you know, at the end of the day, that typically comes back down to real estate. Um, you know, year over year, time and time again, real estate is ranked as the number one, you know, greatest investment that, you know, someone in the United States can potentially make. So, I try to get that point across. I try to use a lot of data in my conversations. And that's like the approach that I really like to take because I think that visuals uh, really help people to, or really help to to drive the point home, right? And get that point across. Um, I like to show people, 
you know, appreciation charts. Hey, this is where you're going to buy at now. And this is the game plan for the next five, maybe even 10 years, right? Take that appreciation and, and show them how they can use that to level up into a bigger and better home later on down the road. And then on top of that, I think, you know, people of my age group specifically, our biggest challenge at the moment is affordability, right? Like we're all used to paying three to $4,000 a month rent. And, you know, it's easier to say than to actually do and talk somebody into, you know, spending eight, $9,000 on a mortgage payment. Luckily, you know, we do have some solutions like the two, one buy down. Um, you thank God Fannie Mae has decided to roll out the 5% down on multi units, um, two to four units. That could be huge. I have several people in my circle actually who have already reached out because they had all been stuck to, you know, looking for a condo or, you know, maybe a cheaper single family and moving outside of the area. Now they have the option to look for something, you know, in our given space, Los Angeles County. They can look for a two to four unit property. They can get in with as little as 5% down and they can combat everybody's, you know, primary issue that we're dealing with right now, which is monthly affordability. They can use the rents from the other units to help supplement that mortgage payment. And on top of that, they can also... Um, supplement the mortgage payment, and then also increase their affordability. So mm -hmm. using those other rents, they can potentially <clears throat> qualify for more than what they could when they were looking at a condo, right? So I think that's something um, you know big that's been coming up in a lot of my conversations recently. Can you explain a little bit more precisely like a specific example and the five to one that you were just explaining? Can you explain it a little bit more? If, if whomever is listening, they're like, wait, I want to figure out what he's talking about specifically, because I may be in a position to take that route as opposed to maybe just investing in something as a single family home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, prior to November 18th and, you know, still currently to this day, the down payment requirement on conventional mortgages for two to four unit properties on two unit properties, it was 15% on three to four unit properties. Um, you know, it used to be 25%. So that's pretty hefty. A lot of people can't really afford that. Um, so, you know. I think a, a, a good point. Sorry, if you don't mind me chiming in. Yeah, no, totally. totally. Um, so the barrier to entry was very high before, right? I mean, as it is if you're a first-time home buyer, coming up with 25% down of the price of real estate in LA is, is difficult, right? So to be able to do a 5% down payment reduces the barrier to entry. You know, I think another thing before we dive into that is that's, and to your point, I think it's important to uh, just kind of get people's wheels turning, right? With just some different tools and how we can approach the purchase of real estate. So one of the first things that I, I ask somebody when we're having that initial consultation, especially knowing that they want to buy in LA, I say, okay, well, do we want to buy the white picket fence or do we want to own real estate? Right? Because there's, two different strategies to that. And what I mean by that is, well, if you want to buy the white picket fence, you want a single family residence to live in. That's great. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. That's beautiful. That's normally what gets people motivated to buy. They see a beautiful home. They could see themselves living there, right? But, you know, especially with that younger generation, that younger crowd, you know, there is a, I think real estate has gotten very popular and you know, people realize what a good investment it is, right? Good investment vehicle. So then it's like, okay, do you want to own real estate? Because then we can start talking about some units, right? And to Matt's point, well, now if we can count the rental income from these other units, well, maybe we can buy a property. doesn't mean that that's the property that you have to live in for the rest of your life. Usually the occupancy agreement that you sign on your loan documents is that you're going to agree to live in the property for one year, right? So great. I mean, what a great stepping stone, right? What a great way to get a real estate investment under your belt. If you can pick up some units, right? Start to build that real estate portfolio, right? Start to get some sources of passive income under your belt, right? So that, that I think has been, you know, inspiring. It at least opens up that, that dialogue and it gets people thinking a little bit differently about it. It inspires confidence, right? It's like, well, Hey, I, you know, I, you know, because you tell somebody they're going to get into whatever payment it is, right, for a single family residence and nothing to offset it. Yes, they realize it might be a good investment over time when they eventually sell the property, right, or move on to the next one or cash out, take a cash out refinance to use some of that equity to purchase something else. 
But if you can show somebody that they can start to generate a return right away, right, and either offset that monthly payment, allow them to qualify for a little bit more, that's, um, those are the conversations I think we need to be having to inspire that confidence, especially during these times. And Matt, you mentioned the uh, the temporary buy down. We call the two one buy down is normally the popular one. I don't want to interrupt you for yeah. a second, but something like before you are going to piggyback off what he was saying. The first thing that came to mind that I started to hear is like coming from a background of like fitness and wellness and nutrition is people are uneducated and they and not like they're uneducated, but they're uneducated about real estate, investing, saving money, spending money, how, how being able to create passive income. They just see something as something or they'll Google what's today's interest rate. So they're not as informed or as educated as someone who may be a lender or a realtor. So before even going into the two to one buy down, is there something that can help educate someone on the steps that they can take today to either do a multifamily or an overall wanting to buy a home? And I know that it's two different things, but they're still very similar as opposed to just Googling what's today's interest rate. Okay, I only really have a million dollars to spend on a property, at least that's what I think. So I only really have this much saved, you know, I'll just say a hundred thousand saved. So how do you educate or how can you educate someone a little bit more in a way that they're making smart moves? Yeah, say? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm very old school. So, you know, I think for me, it's just, it's conversations, right? Like let's, let's start some dialogue. And that's, you know, for me, that's always been my approach. You know, you're not, you're not selling anything, right? I mean, I'm not selling anything. I'm not selling somebody into something that, you know, they don't want to do. I think the important thing is just coming at it from education. And thankfully, I mean, look online, you can find a bunch of great content. Um, our specific team, we fund LA, right? You know, you can log on to our Instagram page. We're constantly putting out great content, mm -hmm. just little nuggets, right? Just little teasers. <laughs> and that's just to kind of get your get your wheels turning. Right. But, um, it's important to kind of, you know, start that conversation. And I like to have the back of the napkin calculations as I like to call them where, Hey, some people aren't ready to take that application just yet. So, Hey, let's just talk some quick numbers. Let's kind of get some ideas of what this might run. Right. But I think, I think the conversations are, are the key piece, right? Just start talking about it. And mm -hmm. that's, it, it can be very intimidating, right? It's like the biggest purchase somebody's ever going to make. Mm -hmm. So uh, for me, I take a very soft approach and just like, hey, let's just chat, right? Let's just talk and mm -hmm. answer questions. And then that's when we get an opportunity to dive into some of those details and maybe planting some seeds on some ideas of how we can go about it. Cool. And now the two to one buy down, or did you want to, Matt, did you want to share? With yeah, you? I would actually love to discuss the two one buy down just because yeah. it's like one of my favorite things that we're seeing in the market nowadays. I know that they were popular back, you know, before my time, obviously. And, you know, we're seeing them become more and more popular once again. Um, you know, kind of like I mentioned before, the number one issue we're facing right now is affordability. Um, so the two one buy down is a great tool in order to combat the affordability crisis that we're dealing with right now. And just, you know, in short, the 2-1 buy down allows the homeowner to take a note rate or take a rate that's 2% below the note rate for the first year, 1% below the note rate for the second year before maturing into the actual note rate for years three and uh, years three, three, through thir three through 30. Um, ba -ba -ba. The 2-1 buy down is great, especially in this market right now. Um, you know, obviously we are dealing with some inventory issues. However, if you pay attention to things like Altos Research, good data points, you'll see that the days on market are actually increasing. We're seeing inventory at the peak for this year so far. So that could present a good opportunity for prospective buyers to take advantage of things like seller credits to help fund the temporary buy down. So the way that the temporary buy down works is it is a seller paid program. We have a calculator that um, you know, we provide people with that actually calculates the cost savings as well as the seller credits that will be required. One thing that's great about the temporary buy down is those seller credit funds that are used for the temporary buy down to subsidize the payment over the first two years are actually held in a separate escrow account. So you can always do a permanent buy down on your mortgage, say like one point maybe gets you a half a percent in rate, maybe a little bit less, 
pay two points, maybe you get three quarters or a whole point. Those funds on a permanent buy down, once they're paid, are no longer accessible. You can't get that money back. On the temporary buy down, when you take advantage of something like that as a buyer, those additional funds that are left over, held in that separate escrow account, if it comes time and you decide to refinance before that two year mark, any leftover funds will actually be credited to you in the form of a principal reduction. So it'll be taken off your loan balance. Mm -hmm. um, personally, for me, that's been a huge thing, inspiring confidence and security with home buyers. Um, just knowing that, hey, we're going to be able to take advantage of a super low payment for year one, you know, relatively low payment for year two before, you know, taking on our full payment years three to 30. And the great thing about the program, too, is that we're not qualifying the people based off the introductory payment. We're qualifying people based off of the fully indexed rate, you know, the actual mature note rate. So that gives them time to kind of ease into the payments, you know, get used to being a homeowner, taking care of maintenance, repairs, things like that, and keeping additional funds on hand just for whatever they need to do around the house. So I think that's huge, um, especially in this market. Yeah, that's really great. I'm such a big person into like mindset. I'm like, we could have this conversation, but where can I shift it to just be then positive? Like we mm -hmm. can talk about the same thing, but then we can also talk about the same thing on a positive note. Absolutely. We can still be talking about the same exact thing. So when I'm listening to your, you're talking about exactly what you're saying. I have like these little critics in the back of my head. And those critics are people, not people that I know, but just people in general being like, well, still, I can't afford that. Well, still, I can't afford that. Well, still, I'm dealing with credit card loans or I'm dealing mm. with this or I'm, you know, I'm dealing with student loans for someone who's younger. Mm -hmm. So these are all like, I'll look at them as like negative, 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 where it's just like, wait, hold up for a second. If we're doing this and we flip it to be something positive, now I'm going to ask both of you guys, what would be a positive just flipping the switch or the script? Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at it or whomever is looking at it in a way where it's just like, yeah, like this is a good thing. This is a good thing. And what would that be? Absolutely. So a couple things. I think um, inevitably there is that initial shock factor, right? Like, oh my goodness. Okay. How much am I going to spend now on purchasing a property? But I think it's important to scale it back. And what a lot of new homeowners don't realize is, you know, you're building an investment, right? Which there's a positive to that, but it doesn't take care of the problem. Like, how can I afford this, right? Um, but I think there's another factor, which is the tax deductibility factor, right? So now that interest that you're paying, right? And I would argue, even now that you're paying higher interest, you're going to get even more of a benefit, right? That interest that you're paying is potentially tax deductible, right? And I'll say potentially because I'm not a CPA. This 8% is tax deductible? Correct. Oh. Correct. It's mortgage interest. Now, again, I'm going to say potential because I'm not a CPA, uh -huh. so I'm not qualified to give tax advice, right? But um, as long as you fit within the parameters, definitely consult your CPA, right? But if you're fitting within those parameters, there is that tax deductibility factor of that interest, right? So at the end of the year, even though you're not seeing, you know, that monthly payment might be higher at the end of the year when you're doing your taxes, if you do like a side-by-side -side comparison of what you paid prior to being a homeowner and what you're paying in taxes after you own a home, you're going to see a difference there, right? Now, granted, you're not going to see that month to month, but at the end of the year, right, you're, you should be getting some money back, right? Or less of a tax liability if you are paying taxes, right? So in leveraging something like this temporary buy-down, this 2-1 buy-down, not only is it easing you into making that payment, right? And to Matt's point, you're still qualifying for that, that highest rate that you would get, right? Over on that third year, right? But that those first two years, keep in mind, most people make more money year over year, right? You know, you normally get a cost of living, a wage increase, right? So year over year, that payment is going to get easier to make. So if you can bridge that gap, reduce what that payment is in the beginning, they're easing into that payment. And I would suggest to your point, like if you do have credit card debt, let's put that money to use in the meantime, right? If you've got, if I'm able to save you a thousand dollars a month on that monthly payment for that first year, let's start knocking out those credit cards. So by the time you get to the second or third year, like you don't have that additional debt load to carry, right? Or if you don't have credit card debt, 
let's stash that money away, right? Like let's get people saving, right? Like let's, so that way you're prepping yourself for that higher payment, you know, it would be my advice, right? Like, hey, let's already prep for making that higher payment and let's just try to put that thousand dollars a month, right, in savings. That way you can have a cushion by the time you get to that third year to where you're not feeling, oh my goodness, I'm overwhelmed. You've got a little bit of a slush fund built up or you've, you know, gotten rid of some credit card debt, some revolving debt. And again, I mean, the 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 real hack to that program is these rates are cyclical. So really, ideally, we're going to refinance that loan before we even hit that third year, right? So, you know, hopefully we'll get an opportunity to maybe get a rate comparable to what we had at the beginning, right? Either that first or second year, right? Where we can refinance into that before even hitting that third year. And I think that's something that a lot of first-time home buyers, you know, don't realize yet is very few people keep that initial mortgage, right? I think I think there's a uh, statistic that states like, you know, a typical homeowner doesn't hold their uh, first mortgage note for any longer than three to five years at most. Yeah. So, so that, that refinancing opportunity is a tool, right? That people use over and over and it's, it's a great tool to use, right? So that payment, I would say that payment is the highest payment that mortgage is ever going to be, right? Because look, if we don't touch it, then we know exactly what we're getting into, right? Mm. But if we get the opportunity to refinance, right? I mean, you're not going to refinance into a higher payment. I mean, not unless you're taking cash out or doing something deliberate for that, right? Where you're getting some benefit from that. But if you're refinancing, you're refinancing into better terms, right? A better interest rate, a better payment. Mm -hmm. So there's, um, you know, th those are the tools that I think for a first time home buyer, right? Those factors that kind of get lost. You're so overwhelmed in the beginning. Oh my goodness, I'm getting a mortgage loan. You're gonna tell me I gotta go through this all over again and do a refinance. But mm -hmm. once you've been through it once and mm -hmm. if you've got a good team working with you, you know, that process should be pretty seamless. Yeah, as smooth and seamless as possible. I think it's also super important for first time home buyers just to be educated on the whole entire process inside and out and also educated about their ability to refinance because a lot of people think, oh, if I take out a refinance, like, is it really going to have any benefit? How much do I need to pay? What are the costs involved? All that kind of stuff. So if you can clear up that air at the beginning of the conversation, I think it helps, um, you know, inspire even more confidence in our prospective buyers. Yeah. I mean, you guys are always talking about this every single day and on the subject of confidence and mental health. I'm going to ask Matt first, um, how daily do you practice either confidence or just taking care of your state of mind? Like, it could be really overwhelming having a lot of conversations with people. Me personally, I'm, I sort of have to check myself. Like, am I being affected by this conversation I'm having with another person that they're bringing a particular type of aggression, not aggression like coming at me, but aggression with what they're sharing and their emotions and is am I being affected by it? So what are those things that, that really help you? Um, to be honest, I... I think the thing that really helps me and helps inspire confidence in myself that I can then relay on to others is is really the team that I work with. I think, uh, you know, these guys that I work with have a really, really big impact on my life and, you know, ultimately my well-being and, and my willingness to be in this industry. Like, it's definitely changed my life over the last couple of years and, you know, can't wait to see what the future has in store as well. Um, I think it's important, you know, to have good people around you who are constantly, you know, providing you with advice and, you know, solutions, resources, and, and tools to help you be better. Because so. you came into this business right out of college. Yeah, right and out of college. And it's really very new. Like, it's yeah. very new. It's super fresh. So, so what do you do on a day-to-day -day basis, besides, you know, feeding off this positivity and support you're getting from your team? What are the things that you do on a day-to-day -day basis that really help bring that out in you for yourself? I read a lot. Oh. A lot of news articles, a lot of housing articles, um, anything that I believe is a you know substantial value, because I think you know knowledge is power at the like? end of the day. And you know the more that you read, the more that you intake, and the more that you can share with others as well. So I think that's huge for me, and it's been the one thing that's really helped me out a, a lot this year. Whether can it's communicating share? with agents, you know, clients, mm -hmm. friends, family, it's really given me an upper hand that I truthfully didn't have before. Yeah, I think that's yeah. great. Can you share something specific that you read? Oh, I'm on Housing Wire every single day. If you haven't heard of Housing Wire, Housing Wire is great for all housing related news. Um, Logan Motoshami, the chief economist over there, he's an absolute wizard. Um, I'm a big fan of Byron Lazine, is a podcast that I listen to, Broke Agent Media. 
And then I have a couple other, you know, books that I read and some self-help stuff. I listen to some audio books here and there. So it's just to try and give me like a little bit of different perspective sometimes because mm -hmm. I used to find myself being too hard on myself, you know, like mm -hmm. never giving myself enough credit, never mm -hmm. looking at like, all the positives of everything. I was always kind of, you know, a little pessimistic, negative here and there. Mm -hmm. And I think lately I've just been trying to shift my mindset, you know, look at things from an outsider's perspective. And, you know, I feel like doing just fine. So Yeah, I agree with you. My YouTube is like full, full of like positivity of stuff besides like total female stuff mm -hmm. because it's my vitamins mm -hmm. i'm like i got i just it's just like a daily thing i'm like cool like cool i'm good but ron you have a nonprofit, correct? yeah yeah i i mean it's not mine but which I, uh... does tie in but i want to hear from the the standpoint of the mental health the confidence where does that come from what is it that you do on a day-to-day -day basis I don't know if we have enough time, but <laughs> <laughs> she's not joking. No. Um, so mindset is, is huge for That's me. That's why I'm not in the position that you guys are in. <laughs> yeah. <I'm> in. <laughs> so, um, I'll tell you, I've always, uh, I've always had a consistent exercise regimen that I stick with. Um, and it's interesting. I often will call it my therapy. I, um, I'm not a morning person but I get myself up in the morning here, here. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I, uh, and I exercise, I exercise. I try to put myself through some physical suffering, you know, um, I think suffering is good. It just kind of brings some perspective and it's a suffering that I can control in a sense. Are right? you into David Goggins? <laughs> I, you know, I, uh, I'm not super into him, but yeah, he's, uh, he's phenomenal. He's I've like definitely heard that, I've definitely heard that name come out of your mouth before. <laughs> he's, uh, no, but it's, I mean, there's so much truth to that, right? Like, so, and it's a win for the day, right? So I can start my day out with a win. Hey, I got that done. Right. And that, um, you know, there's something about that physical pain where you're like, okay, I'm suffering here, but you're going to be okay you make it through it. And there's something that just carries on into the other areas of your life. Like, Hey, okay. I got, I got myself through that. You mm -hmm. know, um, I got into meditation, uh, pre pandemic. I read a book that sat on my shelf for the longest time called autobiography of a Yogi. And, uh, -huh. uh just had a profound impact on me. It, um, got me into do doing some meditation. So I, I meditate after I'm done working out. It's interesting. I've found that that helps me. I'm already physically because I'm tired, right? I feel like it allows me to let go of my body more mm. and just kind of sit into that moment. And um, mm -hmm. that's been a huge help. I, uh, you know, that allows me just to kind of recenter myself and just, hey, what's what's really important, right? Mm -hmm. And approach approach the day that way. You know, even um, just. Uh, Years ago, right? There's been times I, I grew up in this business. I, I was young when I first started. I did not know how to run a business. Like I, I speak Spanish and I'm good with numbers. So that was that was my ticket in. But I always I looked at this like a job for the longest time. And I think once I made the switch and just said, you know, just you know, just let me focus on helping people. Mm -hmm. As hippie as that sounds, but mm -mm. that, uh, mm -mm. Not it, to me. It's, it's, it's hundred percent real. <laughs> it it yeah. was a shift. And, yeah. and I'll tell you like, you know, the, the, the money, whatever you label as and, and whatever you consider success is, is a byproduct, right. Yeah. Of, of your actions and your mindset. And it just flipped the switch for me. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, your body, our bodies is made, are made up of energy and matter. And I'm just going to nerd out for a second. And when you create movement on a day-to-day -day basis, your body releases energy. That energy is both going to be positive and is going to be negative. Neither nor of those things are a good or a bad thing. It's just a day-to-day -day thing, which is why daily working out is essential. Daily movement is because your body needs the energy and the matter to filter what needs to go out and what needs to stabilize and what needs to create grounding. So working out and why it's helping you with your meditation is because your body's own mind is releasing energy and it's pulling the energy that needs to ground itself in that meditation. Like I, 
literally can sit here for two hours, three hours, four hours <laughs> I love and it. talk about that exact thing. And it would blow someone's mind and they would be like, oh, that's why I feel good after I do this. That's why I feel better after to do this. That's why I have more clarity. That's why you feel better after you have water and all this stuff. But I just, I love it. And I, I totally cut you off from what you were saying. But I think it just brings so much value just hearing that both of you as individuals like taking care of your mental health and it's showing up in your business and I I just am so grateful that you guys are here and I wanted to hear about your your chair your nonprofit. Yeah. Can you share yeah. about that nonprofit before I continue just no, rambling? Of course, on? of course, of course. So uh um give you a little back so just you know going into how you show up, right? And I've made it a point to love people, try to love people as much as I can, you mm -hmm. know, and, uh, and I'll, that, that'll be a good segue. I, um, uh, a dear friend of mine, uh, I'm going to name drop here, Dr. Alan Karbelnik. He, um, he, we worked in the same building together for a long time and, uh, I would often see him, uh, at the gym You know, we, uh, and uh, one day he hits me up and it was so beautiful, refreshing and honest. And he goes, hey, man, you know, I'd, I'd like to have some lunch with you. I'd like to get to know you. And I don't know that I've ever had anybody just tell me that, right? Just randomly. So we went to lunch and we hit it off. And um, he goes, hey, I want to introduce you, you know, to something that's a big part of my life. It's a foundation um, called Rose City Center out of Pasadena. And it's a... Um, it's a mental health organization. We provide a sliding scale uh, mental health services. So for people that normally wouldn't be able to afford going to see a therapist, right? We offer it on a sliding scale so they can get a reduced fee to, to go to therapy. And at the same time, it's also a, a training facility, right? For um, doctors that need to do their supervised hours, right? Before going out and setting up their own private practice. So a lot of that resonated with me, you know, maybe because I, uh, you know, just in, in my lending business, right? Like, I don't know that I ever had anybody help me build a book of business, right? So I'm like, oh, how great, you know? These guys get to get some training and, you know, walk out of there with a book of business and, and you're doing mental health. And I am, um, when I went to college, not that I ever pursued anything with it, but I, I did study psychology. So it was, uh, it's always been a, uh, a passion of mine. So it's been kind of cool to come around full circle. Um, and Alan said to me, he goes, hey, he goes, uh, why don't you come in and sit in on a board meeting, right? So I went in, I sat at this board meeting with a bunch of doctors, right? I felt like a total fish out of water, right? And uh, and they needed somebody to, to help with their finances, right? So I think at the end of the first board meeting, they're like, well, hey, great. We'd love to have you join and you know, be the chair of the finance committee and the treasurer, right? And I'm like, oh my goodness, right? Like I just got here, you know? But um, <laughs> I don't know if I'm ready for this. But it was awesome. Everybody was super welcoming. I mean, so much passion within that organization. It was just awesome to see that many people, you know, fully invested in the cause. And um, I didn't realize what an impact it was going to have on me, right? I'm like, okay, that's cool. You know, I, I like to help, you know? So I'm like, I'll help out. And it was great. I mean, I, I joined at the end of 2019 and then the pandemic hit, right? Mm. 2020. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to put it lightly, I was, I was concerned, right? Well, what's going to happen, right? Like, you know, so we made a pretty quick move to go to telehealth, right? In the meantime. And, um, and honestly, the, the pandemic, believe it or not, helped us out. We were able to turn around the finances of that organization. And it, um, built a lot of equity with, with the, uh, with, uh, with the board. And, uh, as of, you know, earlier this year, I, uh, I now sit as the board president, which is awesome. Yeah, so I, uh, yeah, it was incredible. I was, uh, very humbling, very, um, it was just, just incredible to get a chance to make an impact like that. So, yeah, so that's been, uh, that's been my, uh, my passion project here for the past what, three, four years. Yeah. yeah, I think that's awesome. I mean, both of you just bring so much positivity aside from knowledge, like into this space. And I appreciate it. I like to ask my guests three questions before I wrap with them. And either of you can answer first. Mm -hmm. What is a non-negotiable in your morning routine that sets you up for the day? 
It's going to sound a little funny, but a non-negotiable for me in my morning routine is waking up every morning. We typically get up anywhere from 5.30 to 6 a.m., take my dog on a walk, treat him like my son, and, you know, it's literally a non-negotiable. It has to happen every single morning, and that's what kickstarts my day and and puts me in a positive mood moving forward. So as, you know, silly as it is, it's it's the truth. Dogs are the best. They truly are. Yeah. Yeah. How about you? Um... I think I already mentioned my my non negotiable is I uh, waking up I, and hitting the I, gym. I've I've got to I've got to sweat. I've got to I've got to work out in the morning. The day just doesn't feel complete, and um, and I get the bad. I mean, honestly, I, I I take my son to school. I try to take him to school every day, unless there's you know we got a couple of uh, days out of the week where there's uh some things that I'm not able to move. So I guess it. I guess maybe it's not a non negotiable, but if I I try I try to to take my son to school. That's yeah, cool. As often as I can. Yeah, I like that. What is a piece of advice or suggestion you can offer to someone for their mental health, their business, or their relationship? You can go first. On that you one. want me to go first yeah. on that one? Yeah, yeah on of course, one. buddy. Of course. Um, can you give me that question one more time? Yeah. I just want to make sure I hit all yeah, the points. Yeah, of course. What is a suggestion, one suggestion, or piece of advice that you can offer to someone that either is from for their mental health, their business, and or the relationship? Because we're in business of relationships. Absolutely. Um, get over yourself. <laughs> Sorry, the ego it. is not your amigo. Yeah. yeah. All right. It's cool. great. The I e- mean, the yeah. ego is not your amigo. Yeah. Um, so many times I've been my own worst enemy. You know, I've tried to do things on my own, whether it's a sense of pride or whatnot. And um, people are our greatest asset. Reach out to people, you know, ask for help. You know, it's um, there's so many people that want to help that, you know, are there for you. But you've got to knock. Yeah. Yeah. They They have to know. Like they have to be aware. Yeah, I like I think, that. I think that's like my biggest thing that I've been kind of like running into recently is just being like more honest with myself about, you know, who I am, how I feel and, and being able to share and express those feelings with someone else, whether mm-hmm. it's, you know, your partner, whether it's your best friend or a therapist, mm-hmm. like choose someone to get things off of your chest with. Mm-hmm. And I think it will help you tremendously in your day to day life because nothing good comes out of keeping stuff bottled inside. Yeah, so, I like that. That's yeah. what movement helps with. Yeah. Letting that stuff go. Um, what are three qualities of yourself that peers would say about you? I mean, you guys can just basically say for yeah. each other person. <laughs> I will just go based off of kind of what I hear the most on a daily basis. I would say like the three um, primary characteristics, I guess, would be creative, ambitious, and confident at the end of the day. I think those are like the three things I hear the most on a day-to-day basis. Uh, creative because I'm really into photography. I, I love art with a passion. Um, you know, ambitious because I, I never say no. I'm a yes man. I'm constantly out doing everything I can to move the needle forward. And then confident just in the way that I'm able to articulate myself with the people that I surround myself with and, and the clients that I work with as well. Awesome. So yeah. I look forward to seeing how it transcends. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That is great. You hit that spot on. Thank you, bro. You did. It. You did. <laughs> they hit it spot I'm sure, on. Yeah. I'm sure <laughs> you could vouch for yeah. me on that yeah. one. <laughs> uh, it's interesting. You know, not to, I, I love it. I think uh, I would probably say the same creative, ambitious, and uh, my third one would be different. I'm a lover. Not a fighter. I'm a lover. Yeah. Where can people find you guys? Plug yourself. You can find me on Instagram at the Matthew G T H E M A T T H E W letter G, um, or you can look us up on wefundla.net. Yeah, I'm 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 terrible at social media. I'm old school, but you can. I try to. I'm trying. I'm trying. I know. I literally it's... threatened him. <laughs> <laughs> no joke. It's, Thanks. Uh, yeah. So on uh, on Instagram, I'm uh, Ronnie Sans man. R O N N I E S. At Do Not Disturb. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys, for listening. You can follow me at Jessica J. Fury at Jessica Fury Real Estate and follow the podcast. Like, subscribe, support. And thank you so much. I will talk to you soon. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Yay.